What is the main thematic cause of the Civil War? The answer, conflict. King Cotton led to conflict because it was a way for the South to make money. They were able to make that money because the North, and practically everywhere else, needed that cotton. In the case of the North, they turned the raw cotton into a finished product and sold it. Everything would have been very blissful, however, the conflict came in when the South couldn't meet the demand for cotton without the so-called help from the slaves. The different economies between the two sides was a conflict because the North had an economy based on industry and the South had an economy based on agriculture. Also, the labor forces they used were different because the South used slaves and the North did not. Slavery was a conflict because one side, the South, wanted it and another, the North, wanted to totally abolish it. The social views of the North and South caused a conflict because they were so different. The South had social classes while the North had everyone mixed together. The controversy of states' rights versus the federal government also contributes to the thematic cause of the Civil War by how most of the South wanted states to have their own rights and not everyone agreed with them, which of course resulted in conflict. As far as the actual Mexican-American War goes, the United States decisively defeated the Republic of Mexico and acquired over 500,000 square miles of new territory that today compromises much of the nation's southwest. The conflict emerged from an marrying American's belief that their manifest destiny pointed toward a nation of continental scope, stretching from the Atlantic to the Pacific. While the seizure of new territories provided Americas with new lands for settlement, these developments also worsened the growing sectional conflict over the expansion of slavery. Deciding of whether the land that came to us from the Mexican-American War and the Louisiana Purchase would be slave or slave-free became a conflict that led to the Civil War because the North would have preferred that the land became free territories while the South wanted slaves to be allowed in them. The first confrontation over slavery in the West occurred in 1819. Missouri applied for admission to the Union as a slave state. The admission of Missouri would upset the balance of power in the Senate, where at the time there were 11 free states and 11 slave states. Senator Henry Clay proposed a compromise. In 1820, he suggested that Missouri enter as a slave state and remain as a free state to keep the balance of power. Congress also drew an imaginary line across the Louisiana Purchase and at that time it came to be known as the Mason-Dixon Line. North of the line would be free states with the exception of Missouri, and south of the line would be slave states. Our next conflict happened in 1857 when the United States Supreme Court made the landmark ruling in the Dred Scott case. Dred Scott was a slave who applied for freedom. He claimed that because his master had taken him to the free territories of Illinois and Wisconsin, he should be free. The court ruled that because Dred Scott was not considered a citizen but property, he could not file a lawsuit. The court also ruled that Congress had no power to decide the issue of slavery in the territories. This meant that slavery was legal in all territories and the Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional. In 1850, California applied for admission as a free state. Once again, the balance of power in the Senate was threatened. The South did not want to give the North a majority in the Senate. Once again, Henry Clay pleaded for compromise. John C. Calhoun, a senator of South Carolina, stated that the South would not compromise. He demanded that slavery be allowed in the Western territories and that there be a tough unit of slave law. Daniel Webster of Maine offered a solution to keep the Union together. The Compromise of 1850 had four parts. 1. California entered as a free state. 2. The rest of the Mexican session was divided into New Mexico and Utah. In each state, the voters would decide the issue of slavery. 3. Slave trade was ended in Washington, D.C. 4. A new strict fugitive slave law was passed. In 1852, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. This novel told the story of Uncle Tom, an enslaved African American, and his cruel master. In the novel, Stowe read of the evils and cruelty of slavery. While it is argued whether the book was a true portrayal of slavery, the novel still had an enormous influence. The book sold more than 300,000 copies, was published in many languages, and was made into a play. It also helped change the way many Northerners felt about slavery. The conflict of slavery is not only a political problem, but a moral problem as well. After President Thomas Jefferson acquired the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, the United States doubled in size. This purchase gave the United States control of the vast lands west of the Mississippi. As Americans pushed west, the issue of slavery came to the forefront. The conflict came from this question. Would the new territories of the United States be slave or free? In 1854, Stephen Douglas introduced a bill to help solve the problem of slavery in the new Nebraska Territory. He proposed that Nebraska be divided into two territories, Kansas and Nebraska. 
The settlers of the new territories would decide whether they'd be slave or free, which was popular sovereignty. This proposal set off a storm of controversy because it effectively undid the Missouri Compromise. Southerners supported the act when Northerners felt it was a betrayal, which caused an immense controversy. The Kansas-Nebraska Territory set off a bitter violence in the Kansas Territory. More than 200 people died over it. The area became known as Bleeding Kansas. Anti- and pro-slavery forces set up rival governments. The town of Lawrence ended up being destroyed by pro-slavery forces. This angered several anti-slavery people, such as John Brown. In 1859, John Brown and a group of followers organized a raid on Harpers Ferry, Virginia, a federal arsenal. Brown hoped that slaves would come to the arsenal and that he would then lead a massive slave uprising. It was Brown's belief that slavery could only be ended through the use of violence. Brown was unsuccessful and troops led by Robert E. Lee killed 10 raiders and captured John Brown. He was found guilty of murder and treason and sentenced to death. Southerners felt that the North wanted to destroy slavery and the South along with it. Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts was an avowed abolitionist and leader of the Republican Party. He gave a speech in the Senate called The Crime Against Kansas. Part of this oratory was a bitter personal tirade against South Carolina Senator Andrew Butler. He declared Butler an imbecile and said, Senator Butler has chosen a mistress, I mean the hard lot slavery. The speech went on for two days. Representative Preston Brooks of South Carolina thought Sumner went too far. Southerners in the 19th century were raised to live by an Edmund Code of Honor. Defending the reputation of one's family was at the top of the list. A distant cousin of Senator Butler, Brooks decided to teach Charles Sumner a lesson he would not soon forget. Two days after the end of Sumner's speech, Brooks entered the Senate chamber where Sumner was working at his desk. He flatly told Sumner, You have libeled my state and slandered my white-haired old relative, Senator Butler, and I have come to punish you for it. Brooks proceeded to strike Sumner over the head repeatedly with a gold-tipped cane. South Carolina and other southern states were upset when Congress passed the Tariff of 1828, which southerners called the Tariff of Abominations. Southerners saw the tariff as protecting northern industry at the expense of the south and as unconstitutionally expanding the powers of the federal government. Many southerners were not satisfied when Congress lowered tariffs slightly in 1832. In response, South Carolina's state legislature passed laws nullifying the tariffs of 1828 and 1832 and forbidding the collection of the tariffs in South Carolina. In 1846, during the Mexican War, the House of Representatives considered an appropriations bill designed to provide funds for negotiating with the Mexican government. Democrat David Wilmot of Pennsylvania introduced a rider to that measure, which barred slavery from any territory acquired from Mexico. The bill containing the Wilmot Proviso passed the House in 1846 and 1847. Both times, however, it was defeated in the Senate. Measures prohibiting the spread of slavery would be introduced repeatedly by northern lawmakers in the coming years, which would sharpen tensions between the regions. In the mid-1850s, people who opposed slavery were looking for a new voice to be their president. The Republican Party chose Abraham Lincoln, the Southern Democratic Party chose Stephen A. Douglas, the Southern Democratic Party chose John C. Breckinridge, and the Constitutional Union Party chose John Bell as their candidates. Lincoln was against slavery, Douglas and Breckinridge were for popular sovereignty, and Bell was somewhat indecisive of slavery. So when Abraham Lincoln, who was just the new kind of voice that people were looking for, got elected, the South had made a realization. The reaction to the election of President Lincoln was strong. They felt that the country put an abolitionist in the White House. The South felt that the secession was the only option. In 1860, South Carolina seceded from the Union. By February of 1861, Alabama, Florida, Texas, Georgia, Louisiana, and Mississippi had seceded. In 1861, the seven states formed the Confederate States of America. Their president was Jefferson Davis. The South thought they had a right to secede because the Declaration of Independence stated that it is the right of the people to alter or abolish a government that denies the rights of its citizens. Lincoln, they believed, would deny them their right. In 